Psychoanalysis and the cinema were born at the end of the 19th century. Throughout the 20th century, the two new disciplines have been inextricably linked. By 1916, Harvard psychologist Hugo Munsterberg was applying psychoanalytic understanding to the study of the cinema. He suggested that the photoplay more or less replicated the mechanisms of the mind in a way that was more compelling than the typical narrative forms of storytelling. In the 1970s, psychoanalysis became the key discipline called upon to explain a series of diverse concepts, from the way the cinema functioned as an apparatus to the nature of the screen-spectator relationship. Their theories are found in many guises in the ideas of psychoanalysts such as Sigmund Freud and Jacques Lacan. They drew on Freudian theories such as repression, the very sense of the unconscious, representation, dream work, desire, manifest conscious content, the tension between desire and ethics, perversion, scrupavilia, wish fulfillment, voyeurism, fetishism and Oedipal drama. And they drew on Lacanian theories such as the other, the object petit a, jouissance, signification, subjectivity, desire, the lack, the gaze, the mirror stage, ideal ego, imaginary, symbolic, the real, image recognition, primary identification, and subject formation. So how may these psychoanalytic theories be applied to film? How did these ideas relate to the mechanics of cinema? To answer these questions, I will analyse the works of Alfred Hitchcock, Ingmar Bergman, Andrei Tarkovsky, and David Lynch. In a 1968 interview, Ingmar Bergman said this, Sometimes, when I'm dreaming, I'll think, I'll remember this, I'll make a film of it. It's sort of an occupational disease. Ingmar Bergman's films exist on the precipice separating dreams and reality. His film images appear dreamlike. Take this flashback sequence from Sawdust and Tinsel about a clown's humiliation at the hands of his wife. Bergman claimed that this scene was an almost exact representation of something he had dreamed. Bergman said, No other art medium, neither painting nor poetry, can communicate the specific quality of the dream as well as the film can. In a dream, time and space no longer exist, and cinema is uniquely equipped to alter viewers' perceptions of those properties. In the same line, Sergei Lebovic in Psychoanalysis et Cinema poses the closeness of the film medium to dreams. In his study, he concludes that both coincide in their principally visual nature as well as in the absence of a main cause that links the different sequence of images. Bergman cited August Strindberg's 1901 A Dream Play as a major source of inspiration. A dream play follows a fluid dream logic and engages with modern Freudian psychology in its treatment of the unconscious. We can't trust reality on film any more than we can in dreams. Bergman's work suggests that dreaming is cinema's natural state. A flat surface in which we see human bodies and faces, the screen has long been associated in film theory with the mirror. In both cinema and Jacques Lacan's pre-subjective mirror stage, we are before a square, limited, confined surface which allows the objects of the world to be isolated, making them into total objects. Film is aware of a spectator's gaze, just as much as we are aware of the camera and its impossibilities. In persona, projected as it is onto a milky surface, the close-up of two women's faces points to a cinema as a mirror in which we do not see our own countenance, but whose figures we identify with nonetheless sometimes in an obscure, unconscious manner. The film thus suggests that all forms of recognition are at first nothing but misrecognition. Then, through projection and identification with the characters on screen, they become self-recognition, as emphasised in Lacan's mirror theory. In this scene from Cries and Whispers, the actors looked directly into the camera as their diegetic counterparts, the characters, are looking into a mirror that is to say, at themselves, and at us, at one and the same time. While Erland Josephson undermines the surface beauty of Lil Ullman, 
by telling her how hard and selfish she has grown. The scene ambivalently addresses the notion of self-idealization and the deceitfulness contained in mirror images and at large in cinema. Michaud wrote a pioneering study in the field of cinematic voyeurism titled La participation émotionnelle du spectateur à l'action représentée à l'écran. This tackles the study of the strategies that allow the spectator to forget his or her own existence while watching the film and take on the identity of the characters living in the realm of fiction. The level of intimacy achieved between the two women in persona gives rise to a mutual closeness and eventually to a blurring of their identities, so much so that the spectator's sense of identification with the characters are destabilised. The mirror, that is, the cinematic screen, is therefore at once emphasised and shattered. Bergman creates a dreamlike perspective, offering a prison of meanings in order to understand himself, to exercise his own demons. But by doing so, he's also reshaping our understanding of ourselves. Cinema's true affliction, as well as its triumph, is that its answers are often destined to remain unknown, and nowhere is this more truthful than in the work of David Lynch. Psychoanalysis necessarily treats all psychical manifestations as meaningful utterances. Whilst their meanings may be obscure and perhaps even impossible to decipher, psychoanalysis never questions that they mean something. The mark of a Lynchian environment is one whose surface-level pleasantries disguise a hideous underbelly. Lynch said himself, he lives in extreme close-ups, and looking at things closer exposes their true nature. Whether it be the land of opportunity that is Hollywood, or the quaint town of Twin Peaks, they all hold terrible dangers hidden underneath a facade. And like all of Lynch's threats, we don't see them immediately, but the truth tucked away at their core is never completely concealed. Lynch's work emerges from a place within his own subconscious and seeks to activate something with our own mind. Like dreams, cinema also produces elements that are resistant to interpretation, and this is part of the symptomatic force. David Lynch's Mulholland Drive comes to mind as an example of this type of film. Psychoanalysis is largely concerned with the issue of subject formation. Mulholland Drive is about subjectivity and subject formation. Thus, taking repression of the unconsciousness into account is key to understanding the film. The three major Lacanian concepts are the real, the imaginary and the symbolic. The real is the realm of impossible enjoyment. The symbolic refers to the symbolic order of language and communication and the imaginary is the domain of images with which we identify. In Mulholland Drive, Diane is neither happy with her reality nor with her first fantasy. Thus, she fantasizes herself as Betty, creating her own real. She changes her symbolic order by becoming a blonde, upper-class Canadian woman in her imaginary. Lynch submits a series of breaches to what we accept as our reality in the hope that we recognise that what we perceive is only a fraction of what we see. And it's exactly why Lynch intentionally misguides our perceptions through offering plots that embrace a subconscious manner of storytelling. Our expectations so often go unfulfilled in his movies because he shows that we expect so much from life, yet know so little. There is beauty and invention in the process of filmmaking. Cinema invites you to reflect your own emotions and egg life. Fears are products of our psyche. They are outcomes of our own conscious apprehension of reality, a response for what goes on beyond human understanding. Suspense in Hitchcock's filmography is powerful because it is structural, it is character-based, and therefore blurs the line between our reality and the diegetic space. Perception works side by side with film. It is through cinema's gaze of the world that we disrupt our own state of consciousness. Cinema touches our deepest desires, but it's also unsettling because it plays with our darkest fears. The audience can re-encounter terrifying moments involving early anxieties while keeping a safe distance from them and knowing that they can survive them. 
Hitchcock himself perceived films as projections, dreams, constantly evoking childhood fears and common repressed drives as motifs in his filmography. Voyeurism, fear of heights, murder, betrayal, guilt, or even the unsettling notion that chaos lies just beneath the surface of everyday life. Hitchcock's fascination with psychoanalysis is pretty common knowledge at this point, and nowhere are his Freudian themes more overt than in Psycho, a film academics often refer to as the first psychoanalytic thriller. Norman's sexual fixation on his mother is the most obvious Freudian element, but there's also the way that three levels of the Bates home, top floor, ground floor and basement, mirror Freud's three theories of the human subconscious, superego, ego and id, respectively. The top floor, where we hear the voice of mother, hurling insults and prohibitions at Norman, corresponds to the superego. The ground floor, where Norman carries on the everyday business of his life, is the ego, and the cellar is, of course, the id, or the reservoir of illicit drives. When Norman carries the embalmed body of his mother from the top floor to the cellar, transferring her from superego to id, Zizek credits Hitchcock with demonstrating how deeply the superego and the id are connected, as Freud himself was fond of pointing. It is known that Tarkovsky himself often compares the medium of film to the realm of dreams, marking that this art form is one of Oneric status, with an ability unmatched by any other to capture the emotions and actions occurring within dreams. The notion of order in life is an abstract one, and this is reflected in Tarkovsky's cinematic streams of consciousness. His films don't come with pre-packaged deductions, in there lies a truth, but one that must remain unknown to audience and artist alike. In his essay titled The Kekule Problem, Cormac McCarthy questions why the unconscious is so loath to speak to us. In juxtaposing an oneric revelation to a more rudimentary situation where the unconscious speaks directly to its subject, Cormac McCarthy rhetorically wonders why it neglects to simply tell us exactly what it means as opposed to making an enigma out of it. We don't know, but it may it may have to it's do that with, brain thing again. It may have to do with, you know, the subconscious being older than language and maybe it's more comfortable creating little dramas and telling you things. The this can be compared to what Tarkovsky poses in the entirety of his filmography. He invites us to play with our own ideas in the realm of his cinematic unconscious, the realm of the dreams. As opposed to directly telling us, Tarkovsky opts to show us and then leave us to our own devices. Slovenian philosopher Slavoj Zizek also brings up the motif of dreams in his film analysis documentary, The Pervert's Guide to Cinema. While discussing Tarkovsky's filmography, he argues how two of the Russian filmmakers' works use dreams in a particular manner as a form of characteristic distress. The first example can be found in 1972's Solaris, a world which Zizek describes as cold and stark, where the characters use this planet's strange power of bringing to life people in the characters' lives who have long been dead. Zizek here cites Sigmund Freud's studies of the human conscious in describing such a situation as an id machine, one that effectively realises the character's deepest desires and nightmares. In the case of Solaris's main character, Chris Calvin, that desire can be found in the reincarnated form of his suicidal wife. The second film, that, according to Zizek, uses Tarkovsky's dreams as a method of telling the story and creating conflict is Stalker. It is here that the audience comes into contact along with the stalker, writer and professor, the aforementioned zone, which is reported to hold a room at its very centre, in which person's deepest desires can be realised. The premise, in turn, seems similar to that of Solaris, but these two worlds could very much be considered as antithetical in their natures. Whereas Solaris focuses on trapping its characters within these desires, Stalker tells of the journey the characters face in trying to understand and recognise what exactly it is that they hold within themselves. In Stalker, 
Tarkovsky ultimately disavows the party of three from ever getting to enter the room, and the climactic scene shows the group sitting in front of the room, watching it, but never... Through these characters, we realise that we don't want the room to exist, at least, not in its physical form. Rather, we want it to exist as a window to another world where we can project our fears and desires, just like a cinema screen. There is nothing specific about the zone. It's purely a place where a certain limit is set. Tarkovsky's aim was to have the audience discover meaning for themselves. When the methods of a director remain a mystery to the audience, they are inclined to find significance in that reality. We think further on that which we don't understand, regardless of the explanation of the zone in Stalker or the ocean in Solaris. In the words of David Lynch, I don't know why people expect art to make sense when they accept the fact that life doesn't make sense.